So several weeks ago, we did a, a taste test on the canary melon, and mm -hmm. and we weren't. I wasn't real sure how to tell when they were ready. I kind of went by the curly cue, and uh, I, I think on these canary melons, that is probably not necessarily the best indicator. And um, it, they just seemed like they weren't quite ripe enough. So I have just haven't messed with them anymore. I've sprayed them a couple of times. The vines are kind of dying back now. I just kind of left them out there and was going to wait until they turn bright yellow. Oh, that's pretty. Which was uh, a no, little worm trying to get in there, a little pickle worm. Anyway, I got a couple here. One's a little more bright yellow. I washed that one. That one's a little, that one's been shined up. Anywho, so they're called winter melons, or a lot of people call them that. So my theory was, well, I'm going to treat them kind of like winter squash. I'm just going to leave them out there and um, let them turn yellow and then pick them and eat them. So now, you don't let them cure like you would a winter squash. I, well, I, not some of the winter squash. I don't know yet. Anyway, I tried, I did try one, and uh, we're about to try one now. So, the fact though that you leave them out there, if it was earlier in the year, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. But leaving them out there this time of year, I did get some that rotted. I got some that got worms in them bad just because I don't think you'd have that issue if you planted them in early spring. So, there's some risk in leaving them out there. But uh, I think you definitely want to wait till the color turns a nice yellow like that right it's there. It's popping pretty good. It, it, they do pop a little better than that other one did. Well, it doesn't look much different on the inside. The texture is is considerably different to me. If I find that pickle worm, I'll let you know. All right. Oh, that's a lot better than the last one we ate. Somebody said it tastes kind of like a pear. I wasn't impressed with that other one in case you didn't realize. Yeah, no, I know. I, I wasn't really either. Um, I mean, I, I eat it, but... That's pretty good there. But it is a unique flavor to it. I would say that. It ain't as sweet as a watermelon. It's pretty sweet. It ain't quite as sweet as a watermelon. But it ain't quite as melony as a honeydew or a cantaloupe. No, it has the texture of kind of a cantaloupe to me. It's a nice, refreshing taste. I'd uh, I definitely grow them again. I like them. Yeah. I ain't a huge fan of cantaloupe. I'm not either. But I like this a lot better than I like cantaloupe. Oh yeah. Anyway, I'll let you hang on to that one there. Well, you might want to put that one in the refrigerator. Yeah. That'd be good. That would be good cold. It's weird to me how the the texture was it was almost you know with the watermelon it seems like the long the texture gets softer the longer it sits out there with well, this one the texture kind of developed and got crispier more crispy the longer it sit out there more which crispy. is interesting like that's good, good English, more crispy mm -hmm. and the fact that it's powdery mildew resistant makes it really help growing it in the heat of summer like yeah. i did so would you recommend this as a follow-up uh, some of the other crops these spring crops as a summer crop i say it, it can be done i say you probably have a better better crop had you grown them in spring plant them when you normally plant watermelons however i have kind of proved that it can be done you know you can plant these in shoot i don't know when we plant what them these things eat up with seeds are they is this a hybrid or open pollinator it's a hybrid so we really can't save the seeds no but they're easy to get out of there you oh, just yeah. uh i gave tie tie some this morning I just spooned him out of there and um What Ty Ty say? Ty, you know Ty Ty he'll eat about anything, but he yeah. said he said good. Good. Mm. Yep. I like it. I do too. I think I'll definitely grow them again. Yep. What else we got going on here? Well you know it's got kind of a year where everybody's thinking about seed start for fall. Mm-hmm. We had a customer come by yesterday, ordered a lot of stuff, or not ordered, picked up a lot of seed. He was getting really worked up for uh, for fall. Mm -hmm. And what was his name? Which one? The one that come by yesterday. We had several come by yesterday. Well, the one that bought $150 worth. I don't know who, Chapel? Chapel! Chapel, yeah. Chapel come by and bought a bunch of seeds. 
and uh, he's all excited. He was asking me when to plant what, when to where. Now, we've been out of seed starting kits for a while. And we have revamped our seed starting kits, and we've been working on this for the last three or four weeks. I hope by next week we have some back in stock. Bottom tray should be here next week or two. Should be. We're gonna be. We're gonna be. I can tell y'all folks what the issue is, and this is really strange for this virus pandemic. We have seen weird things, shortages of that we can't get our hands on, and one of them is seed starting or potting soil. Of all the things out there, seed starting and potting soil is short and the manufacturers cannot keep up. They put you anywhere from a month, six weeks out. So that is one of our big holdups is getting some of that in. We've got a partial shipment coming in tomorrow or Friday and then they have promised us some more since they can give it to us. Uh, but we got some uh, new seed starting kits going out. So we'll have limited supply for probably about three weeks and we got a shipment coming in from Europe. So we'll have the uh, premium seed start kits, we'll have those back in, but the holdup's gonna be the pot mix, I can tell you right now. And we're just gonna be working with what we can get there. They're gonna let us have some, they're not gonna let us have all we want, so. And we're going to, we, I know we preached about the Pro Mix for years. Uh, there's another brand out there that we have tried in the past that works really well called SunGrow. And that's actually what we're gonna be going to. We can get it in some smaller bags. We don't have to repack it ourselves. Um, and we've tested it and it's- I really like it, y'all. I tell you, it's, it, to me, it's a lot cleaner mix. Um, it, it's a little finer. Doesn't have, um, doesn't have as much little pieces of wood or, or stuff in there. Mm -hmm. So we got that coming. Speaking of things coming, this is exciting to me. So, we're gonna be, we, we offer everything in the small seed packs like you see here, but we do some stuff in bulk and we're gonna be doing a lot more stuff in bulk, offering more larger quantities of seed for those people who grow a bigger garden or just wanna, you know, you get more bang for your buck, the more you order, kind of that deal. Now in the past, with cover crops or anything, we have packaged them in these little craft bags, put a sticker on them. But we got some fancy bags here, and we should be able to, we gotta work through what we got packed in the craft bags, but uh, we'll be implementing these in the next couple months. Now, I, I should have did a little more research on this, but, so these are foil bags, okay? So the inside of them has foil there. And I don't quite remember the exact scientific reason behind why seeds keep better in here, but I can tell you that they do. It was because of the moisture. Moisture cannot penetrate that. Humidity cannot penetrate it. So, if you do want to, you know, if you want to purchase some seeds in spring and then you know you're going to plant a fall crop for them, you can go ahead and get all you need and uh, they'll store really well mm -hmm. in these foil bags here. Yeah, this is the best way as far as packaging goes to, uh, to store your seeds. Now we want them because they really look nice and we want to, you know, give a nice looking package for our consumer. So we did this for that reason. But as far as the, the seeds staying viable in these seed packs, this is the best packet on the market to keep your seeds in. Right. So we, we're gonna have, you know, several different options there. Got a nice, nice little, that'd be what a 10 pound bag yeah, And all like. of them except for the great big one right here have they got the Ziploc thing on there so you can seal them back, which is really nice. Uh, if you don't use all your seeds, you can just seal them back up. And this big bag here is gonna allow us to do some 20 pound quantities maybe even 25 pound depending on the crop. So on some of your corn, field corns and stuff like that, we can offer some nice 20, 25 pound bags, depending on what weight we can, we can fit in here. But I'm really excited about these bags. They look good. Uh, you're gonna be excited when you receive them and your seeds are gonna keep well while they're in the bags in our warehouse and also when they get to you um, yeah. in route and at your house. That's kind of nifty, didn't it? It does look all fancy. Yep. All fancied up. Fancied up. So we got the new seed bags. Um, as far as planting, what's going on as far as planting in the garden? Uh, got a video coming out this Saturday showing different ways to address or terminate cover crops. You know, some people say, you want to mow it? Do you want to crimp it? When do you want to mow it? Do you want to mow it when it's full size or maybe when it's just a couple feet tall? Once you mow it, do you want to tarp it? Do you want to till it? Do you want to till it then tarp it? 
Lots of different. Ooh, got me all confused there. What I want to do. Lots of different things you can do, and there's no really right or wrong. And we got a video coming out this Saturday. I'll be talking about all that, just showing you the different options you can use based on what equipment you got. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm uh, my I'm going to be planting some more sun I, that sunflower cover crop I did. Boy, I really really enjoyed that. And um, so I got a, one of my plots that's about 30 by 60. I'm about to load it up with sunflowers. And we got some new ones on the site. We just added some dwarf sunflowers. And these dwarf sunflowers are ideal for y'all. We got those raised beds out there. Raised beds, yeah. Um, containers, anything like that. I tell you what, they're also gonna be good for. They're gonna be good for cover crops if somebody doesn't have a big brush mower to knock it down. Yeah, because very these, dependent upon the lawnmower, that would work. These things are only going to get a couple feet tall. Yep. So you could stack them in there and then it'd be easy to terminate them. We got three different ones here. We got the sun gold. That one kind of looks like the teddy bear sunflowers. Yeah, so that's yeah. what they call a double bloom. Yep. So it doesn't really have a disc. It's just petals all the way around. The sun spot. And this one has more of a traditional sunflower head on it. These heads on here are supposed to get like 10 to 12 inches in diameter. And then this one here, which I really like, this Mardi Gras blend is really nice. And all these are only going to get about two to three foot tall. Yeah, and the thing about those two varieties right there, you look at it, 60 days to maturity. That's quick. Yeah. Well, now we also got a few from transplants, some new varieties. I'm not going to mention the names of them until we try them a little bit that we're trialing to add next year. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is on one side of the plot, plant those a few rows of those taller ones with the transplants and then have these in front of them and have kind of a staggered look. You know, we're adding a lot of sunflower varieties and we're going to be the sunflower one stop super shop. One thing I was, that? yeah, I like that. We're going to be sunflower source. Yep. The other thing I thought about doing, uh, and this, this takes a little planning, but say you got a plot here on the back end of the plot plant some of them giants in front of those plant some of the regular heights like your chocolate cherry or joker and then in front of that plant some of these dwarf ones you have a step in the little front. dimensional Ooh. sunflower plot there i think that could be really pretty it would. what else folks have been asking about english peas um and i can tell you english peas are in short supply all across the country really um Several of your standard OP varieties uh, are hard to find. Now, we'll be getting some more in probably in the next few months. Um, but we do got a new variety that I can get plenty of that we just added called Sugar Prince. And uh, now English peas aren't known for having super great germination rates. But this one's got a 93% germination rate That's on it. Um, so we got this. We've had it in pounds. We got it in packets now. Those of you that are getting ready to plant your fall crop of English peas, we have got them. One more thing, where I'm at. Uh, so, uh, I haven't seen a rabbit in a while. Have you? Yeah. You have? I haven't seen one in quite a while, but every now and then, this time of year is when it happens, I'll start seeing one out there. And I, I hadn't had to eliminate a rabbit in a long time, but I've been seeing one. And they, they'll pop up. This time of year, they know that I'm gonna be subject to be putting some ca some cabbage and some collards and some broccoli in the ground uh, in a month or so, and they out there scouting is what they're doing. Yeah. And tell a lot of buddies, look, your old tribe's getting ready. We got to get them up. And um, I, I done had a talk with this one rabbit, and I done told him, I said, you, you. Uh, you're on my territory. You got to get out. You're of on my list. You're on my list. And if you don't get gone with a quickness, we're gonna have to. That uh, sounds like the conversation I have with snakes. Now I'll tell them. I said, look here. We can live together, but we can't live together. You got to get out of him. And I tell him once or twice, if he don't leave, then, then he leaves on my turn. That's right. That's right. If Mr. Rabbit don't find him, somebody else's garden or forest, uh, we'll have to sling some lead. Mm. So. I'm gonna give him a chance. He's got about a month before he needs to get on out of there. Yep. 
So what about a recipe thing? Are we still doing that? We are. We are still taking recipes. And uh, if you want to be a part of our row by row recipe book, which is probably going to take us about a year to put together, uh, you can send those. Uh, recipes to cuss serve at hostels.com. I had a call this morning and he was telling me about a recipe and he said, I'll be glad to send it to you. But you got to promise me one thing. I said, what's that? He said, you won't share it with nobody. Must have been a good one. I said, Woo, that's tough right there. Send it to me and I'll see what I can do. So he's going to send me something and if it's real good, I may share the end results with everybody but I won't share the recipe because he told me to keep it under wraps. Mm, that melon is good now. So today, well, last week we talked about eight tips for somebody going to start a small-scale market farm or trying to run a small-scale market farm. We had a lot of good feedback from that show. Uh, we appreciate everybody commenting on that. And if you didn't see that show, um, you can go back and watch last week's show. It'll make more sense and kind of tie in this week's show what we're going to talk about. So this week we're talking about the specific model than I've been using successfully for the last five years. And, and we said this on last week's show, I'm probably hanging up the market farming boots sometime uh, by the end of the year. Not because it hasn't been successful, just because I want to use my plots to do more fun stuff like growing canary melons or growing cover crops of sunflowers, stuff that I ain't really selling, I just want to eat and snack on and kind of experiment with. So let's get into the model that we use. There's several different models that you could use if you were selling produce. You got your farmer's market or your truck farmers as I call them. So some of them actually set up at the farmer's market. Some of them haul a produce truck. You used to do that a little bit back in the day. Yeah, or set up on side roads. Set up on side roads, yeah. sell collards, corn, right. whatever. By the way, that's a poor way to make a living, but let's go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got your CSA or your community supported agriculture and usually the way that works is you sell shares at the beginning of the season uh, and then you get a bag every two weeks, every month, however often the farmer wants to work out uh, that share delivery. And then we got the model I use which is kind of a modified model and it's, we just call it the weekly veggie bag model. Uh, so what this is, is we have a weekly bag that can be bought from week to week. There's no weekly commitment. There's a fixed number of items per bag, and we'll get into what that means. Uh, but there's no subscription there. <coughs> someone, can, <coughs> someone could buy a bag for three weeks in a row, then take not buy one for two weeks. It's just on a week-to-week -week deal. And that works pretty well because a lot of people... You know, it's a decent amount of produce in these bags. A lot of people just want a bag every other week. I want to want one um, one week. And some people, every now and then, want to buy one for the grandma, and they buy two. So, mm -hmm. so let me get out. This is this week's bag here. Oh, That's a $20 bag? $25. $25. So there's five items in here. And... And these items will vary. I'll just give you an idea of what we're working with this week here. <coughs> so first of all, we got some okra here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we got a nice little sack of okra there. Wow. That's a plenty, plenty enough okra for somebody. Um, we got some bell peppers in there. These ain't real huge. They struggle a little bit this time of year, but bell peppers. Personal size bell peppers. Yep. We got a good little mess of nanner peppers there. Wow, that's a lot of banana peppers for one family. Yeah, well, so we like to, me and my wife eat a bunch of them. We like stuff them with cream cheese. Yeah, I, can, right. I can eat a belly full of them. We got some cucumbers here. And then we got, uh, I give them, I either give them one big South Anna butternut squash or two of these littler so ones. So this is $25 bag. $25. That's a bargain. $25 worth of produce right here. Now a lot of people will ask how, so basically five, you figure $5 per item. But with this particular model, the advantage of this is some of this stuff in the bag, you might not be able to sell individually for $5. But when you bundle it together, uh, they're getting a lot more. Bundle. Like bundle. cell phone companies do. Bundle it together. Bundle it together. A lot of people will ask how much, how do you know how much to put in each bag? And, and I honestly, I don't take the time to weigh it. 
uh, that would just take a lot more time on my hands to weigh it. And I kind of eyeball it and I put what I think is enough in there for a family of four to have a meal on. You know, not necessarily leftovers, nothing they're put up, but a family of four to have a good meal on. And in some instances, when I got a bumper crop of cucumbers going, I'll load up the cucumbers a little more just because I don't want to waste any. And I, you know, we'll try to be generous when we have <coughs> more than, you know, what we can sell. So that's, that's what the bag looks like there. The growing part, as I always say, is the easy part. Yep. So I will just share with one thing. If somebody wanted to do this, and I know we skipped over to the farmer's market part of it a little bit, but I'm going to touch back on this. Okay. If you do have property and you could set up a, a your own farmer's market. Roadside. Your roadside stand. Uh-huh. I've, I've witnessed a couple of these, and I can tell you they work well, and there's a trick to it. So the couple that I have witnessed is they also do fruits, peach trees and blueberries and blackberries. And they sell that along with produce there and they may only open Thursday, Friday and Saturday or Friday, Saturday and Sunday, whatever. So that's the downside of it is you're only opening on the weekend. But here's what they do. They offer ice cream. So they take those fruits that are going bad such as their peaches and blackberries and blueberries or they may have oversupply of and they make ice cream that's draw so they sell the ice cream and they sell the fruits and vegetables watermelon squash and everything else too and man these two that i can tell you that we have visited knock it out of the park they'll have people line up waiting to get in there which i think is a brilliant idea i would never thought about but the ice cream thing Takes a little bit on initial investment. Ice cream thing is a kicker, man. That is a that's a wonderful deal. Yeah, well, if, if you can, if you, you don't mind a lot of staff. I mean, you got to have staff to work and everything. You, you don't mind working commitment. all weekend. You got to have commitment. But if you want to do something and uh, and you know during the winter months, it's not going to be a, a thing. So spring, summer on into fall. Hate when fall gets there. You can always push your pumpkins and things like that. Your winter squash. Uh -huh. So the drawbacks to it is, is in the dead of winter, you're going to be struggling a little bit. Also, is the weekends. you got to commit to your weekends. Besides that, hey, it's one of the best looking uh, models I've seen. Yeah, it's more of what I, I call like an agritourism model. Yeah, but you can move your product that way. Oh, yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure. So on the marketing side, which I always say is the toughest side, we rely on social media greatly uh, to market our products. So now, back in the day, when I say back then, I mean about two years ago, you used to could cheat the Facebook system a little bit. You could create a group page and get people to, you all right? Yeah, I think I found my pickle worm. He might have run through that little piece right there. Yeah, we all right. Anyway, <coughs> you used to be able to create a group page on Facebook and whoever was a part of that group, they would see every single post you posted in there. That's not the case anymore. Facebook kind of caught on to small businesses doing that. And now you kind of, if you want everybody that follows you or whatever to see your post, you have to start a business page and pay to boost that post. So you mean to tell me everybody on our Robo Row group didn't see every post? No, uh -uh. I don't see every no, post. Because a lot of times I'll see one post, I'll go to the group page and I'll just kind of, uh, you know, go through the news feed. Oh, I didn't, you know. Yeah, yeah, they, they, well, it, it's gotten to the point where there's so many posts in there. And if y'all ain't, you know, part of our row by row group on Facebook, you can check it out. But there's so many good posts in there that if they did show everybody every post, their news feed wouldn't be nothing but row by row stuff. So, oh, so they have to kind of filter it to some extent. How they do that, I don't know. Anyway, so we use a Facebook business page, just like Hoss Tools has. And um, that's where we advertise our bag on a weekly basis now when we first started out we didn't really have a good idea or good uh, finger on the pulse of when was the best time to post that week's bag items when to sell it we would just do it whenever I could get enough harvested to sell the bags now over time we realized that the best time to do it was on Saturday and Sunday mm. preferably Sunday Sunday uh, people is when people think about 
the meals, planning the meals for the week. And I didn't know this because we grew up in the country and it's a little different for us, but folks that live in town, they eat at the house during the week and on the weekends, that's when they like to go out to eat. Well, let's just talk. We don't, yeah. yeah. So, uh, we used to do posts on like Thursday or Friday and we didn't get any traction because folks said, I don't want to buy this if I won't go out to eat this weekend. Or I'm going to be gone this weekend. Or, yeah, I'm going to be gone. So we figured out that we do our post on Saturday or Sunday, it, it gets a lot more traction. Makes sense. So what my wife does is she just puts a post on there and she'll put a picture of one of these items and she'll list, excuse me, every item that could be in the bag. Now there could be more possibilities than just this combination here. I've got muscadines ready right now. A little bit of elephant garlic left. So some people may get muscadines instead of bell peppers or so. So we just list the possible items and we tell everybody that they're going to get five of those items. The trick there, you can't let customers pick and choose what they want in the bag because then it will take you forever to pack the bags. If you... Some people just can't make it their mind. Right. So your mother being one of them at the drive-thru. Yeah. Yeah. Give her too many choices, she just gets la 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 in her. Mm. People waiting on behind us blowing the horn. Yeah, I was telling her, I said, it's just a meal. It ain't it ain't something that's going, you know, just, just make pick it, a let's number. Pick, let's do something, yeah. please. Let's number three, on. number four. Mm. So we don't for the, now, if I got one person that says, I absolutely hate onions, I won't put onions in the bag. For the most part, we don't let them customize it. And um, so we, we take orders on Facebook, also via email. We send out email. We do that on Saturday or Sunday and then deliver. My wife works in the middle. Uh, she works at the courthouse in the town she works in. So centrally located office and she does deliveries or pickups uh, from there. Now this summer, it worked out pretty good. We had a, a kid that was home for college for the summer and uh, we pay him $5 a bag. We'd lose $5, but it was worth it. He'd come on Sundays and pick it all up and then go deliver it for us. Hmm. Now, we tried doing that ourselves, and it's pretty time consuming, but uh, it worked out to hire a little courier there. What about your growing strategies? So several things that, that I learned over over the, my time doing this that, that I kind of need had to, you know, keep in mind to make sure I'm not just overworking myself for what little bit we earn from this. First one is to minimize your processing and handling. If you sitting there and got to wash and pick through everything and, and you spending a lot of time handling your stuff after you pick it or spend a lot of time picking, you ain't going to be, uh, you're going to have too much in your labor and you're not going to be making much on your produce. So you, you I try not to wash nothing unless I absolutely have to. Um, just try to minimize that processes and ha process and handling. Yes, if we was doing this on a bigger scale, I would probably go with a little better packaging than my brown bag and these. But for what we've been doing, these work good and things store really well in these in the fridge. Now, how many of these bags do you sell a week normally? It averages, it could be, you know, this time of year is a little slow, but in peak time, it could be anywhere from 15 to 30 bags a week. Really? Yeah. So you're taking that, let's see, 10 bags is $250. Right. 20 bags is 500 30 bags is $750 a week. Yeah. Really? Wow. Maybe and, I'm in the wrong business. And that's just doing it on the side. So, you know, if you've got the customers, you can do all right with it. Yeah, one of our problems is that people don't know where we live. We don't live in a very populated area, so it's kind of it's a little bit of a... And, and our, our bag sales are spread across two or three towns, actually, <clears throat> um, that my wife works in. The other thing, another thing I've learned is that you got to focus on crops that store well, whether that be in dry storage or in the fridge. Things that don't store well are hard for me to do because I, I, I prefer to pick one time a week and then sell it and not be picking all throughout the week. Things like winter squash are perfect for this model because once you have them on the storage shelf, you don't have to do anything to them. You don't have to wash them or anything. I mean, you just grab them, throw them in the bag, boom, you're ready to go. 
onions, garlic. That's why I grow so many onions. Onions are perfect for this model garlic too. Once you've yeah. got them on the storage rack, you just, you know, grab them. For you folks who live up in the <clears throat> five and six, heck even in seven, garlic is a known, is a no brainer. There's a lot of these real unique varieties out there that you can get a premium on. Garlic is a shoe in there. Other thing, sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes, all those store really well. So once you grow a big crop of those items, man, you've got them there to pull from and you don't have to worry about, man, how, how's, is this plant going to live or not? Because it's already been harvested, it's already there. Um, things that store well in the fridge, peppers store really well in the fridge. I can get two weeks easy out of peppers. Cucumbers the same way. Um, root crops store well in the fridge. Carrots store really well. Beets store really well and rutabagas store really well in the fridge. That's why I've been, did a lot of rutabagas last year because they store Man, so I well. I me a miss them the night. Cut them up, cube them up. Good. That was good. So with that being said, we don't, we try not to focus as much on crops that don't store very well. Tomatoes. Now I, I grew a bunch of tomatoes this year. We used most of them to put up. I didn't really put a whole lot of them in the bags. They don't store well, they don't transport well. They just don't fit this model very good. Now, if you got a roadside stand, you can sell them all day. Or if you do like old James George does and use them as a value-added product and you can make sauces out of them or things like that, and then they have storage or shelf life to them, then you can move them. It's just another great idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sweet corn. I, sweet corn not only does it hold very well, and it, sweet corn is tricky because the day you need to pick it, compared to when your delivery day is, you might get strung out a little bit there. <clears throat> now we grow sweet corn. Sweet corn is a good draw for us. A lot of people will want to buy a bag if it's got sweet corn in it, but sweet corn is not one of those crops I really, really count on for my bags. Yeah. Uh, another one is broccoli. Surprisingly, broccoli is a huge draw. But man, broccoli takes a good bit of, of growing effort and you just get one head there per plant, which is not a lot of produce. Uh, so we grow it as a draw, but it's one of those things I don't really count on and I don't really uh, like to grow a ton of it. Well, you know, microgreens, we've done a lot of research and work with microgreens. If you can develop your market for microgreens, you can grow worlds of these things real quick. We grew some off for 21 days and we cut that bed three times. But you got to develop a market on because it has a very short shelf life. And if you don't have the market to move that product, then you're going to end up throwing a lot away. I can grow the fire out of them and I can cut them, but I just don't have, you know, it's not what like when I tell people I've got mixed greens in the bags of sweet, they're just going no, crazy. Yeah. And like you said, the shelf life on them is not that great, yeah. especially when you're not washing them and bubbling like us. So that's not one I count on, whereas a lot of the market farmers up north, they, you know, that's their bread and butter. <clears throat> so I mentioned as far as growing strategies, we want to grow really, really big crops of these dry storage crops. Winter squash, potatoes, sweet potatoes, onions, and garlic. That's why we grow real big plots of those because I can have these on the shelf and I can put these in bags for three months. And it's something I ain't got to worry about growing. Yeah, another thing for you out there that don't want a market farm that you just want to be have a very good homestead where you can be prepared. What he just said works exactly for the homestead. You want to grow these crops like winter squash, potatoes, onions, things that can store without refrigeration for a long period of time and provide food for your family. It's a great strategy to have. Mm -hmm. A few more final tips to close here. Things to consider when you're doing this model, you always have to be planting and you always have to be planting. Even when you think you shouldn't be planting something, you always got to be planting something because you always got to have stuff to put in the bags. If you just got three items, that ain't really no good if your model is based around five items per bag. You never know when you're going to have crop failure, so you got to have a backup. So you always got to be planting stuff all the time. And, and, and I will admit it. It does become a little bit exhausting uh, over uh, you know a five year span. Now, one thing you really got to be wary of if you're doing market farming is growing some of these unique and fun things to grow. Because although they may be real fun for you and your family to try new things, very seldom does your customers want to 
uh, participate in your endeavors of growing unique stuff like this canary melon probably wouldn't go over real good with the market because they don't know what they are. Well, not only would it not go over good, my wife ain't going to want to tote one of these bags with these big old canary melons in it. Yeah. I mean, she was cussing me last year about them big old cabbages. Well, to give you an example, in my garden right now, I got vine okra, which is the uh, one of the loofahs we've talked about. I got that growing. I got buell gourds growing. Man, I seen a picture uh, um, intern Charlie posted on Instagram of those. Those are looking they pretty. Nice. But what good is that as far as they as <coughs> a, a item in a market farm? Right, right. It's not. So it doesn't lend itself well to reaching that area and experimenting and growing those fun things. Is growing the staples that you have to grow for a market farm. Yeah, so so with our <coughs> operation, if we're trying to sustain this, we rarely experiment. We got to do stuff we know is going to work. Try Now, we may experiment with some timing as far as getting something in earlier, trying to squeeze in one more crop. But as far as uh, different types of vegetables, different crops, we rarely experiment because it's hard to convince a customer that this right here is as good as it as it tastes right now. You got to stick to the staples that consumer are familiar with. And I, like you said, always plant more than you think you'll need because um, you never know. It, one last thing is interesting as far as your workload, how this kind of works. So in the spring and the summer, you're pretty much you're busy picking and packing all throughout the week because those crops that you're growing need frequent harvesting your okra you got to harvest okra every other day every two or three days your squash you got to pick them every other day your cucumbers you got to pick them over the day so by the time the weekend rolls around in the spring and summer you pretty much got everything packed yep. for your vegetable bag sales now transition to your fall or winter crops your things like cabbage karavi kale rutabagas all that good stuff that stuff is a one-time harvest and it holds in the field well during the cooler months so in those months your weeks are pretty free as far as your evenings what you're going to be doing but then you're going to have a good long stretch on either saturday or sunday when you got to go out there cut all that cabbage you get all them collards and kale so it's, your time management is different from the warm season to the cool season i concur you concur <clears throat> All right, if anybody has any more questions about our little bag model here, and, and I doubt I'll ever write a book on it or anything else, this will be probably my only documentation of my success as a market farmer, but uh, at, at, least we, uh, at least we told everybody about it at least one time. Yep. So let's move on to some questions. All right. If we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostels.com. We'll send you a nice little prize. Well, we got a long one here from Gerald Mann. You going you gonna summarize that? No, I sure am. It says great video about market farming last week. My question is what do y'all think about incorporating non food crops into market farm models? For instance, Greg has mentioned cut flowers in the past. One of my favorite farm channels has said he can sell sup he can sell cut sunflowers to florists for additional revenue. I also know you guys have mentioned calendrum to reduce insect pressure and Travis mentioned making infused oil from the petals. I thought maybe about having a secondary product like dried petals may be a good option to sell online in cool months due to the uh, ease of shipping. Thanks as always. So, I do think you can diversify a little bit. I wouldn't say, I would say that I would probably never consider substituting one of these vegetable items for something like a flour or a non food product because like, this is what it is it's a vegetable bag. But I do think you can develop add on items that would work great to complement what you're doing. I've always wanted to add flowers as a component, as an add-on. You know, 10 more dollars, you get a nice bouquet or bucket of flowers. I just never really figured out how to package them so my wife can deliver them. Uh, that was kind of always the hang-up for us. Yeah, I think it's got a huge amount of potential, but you're gonna have to get, get geared up for it. I've seen people rig up these little things in the back of their van. They build them some wood racks, 
where the little vases would sit down and they do that. So, I mean, I think it works. I think it's a great Yeah, model. you just got to rig up a way you to gotta, trim. Yeah, you got to do a little planning for it. As far as the other stuff like making oils or other items from your vegetables and selling those, I think you got to be real, real careful with that. Because if, if you ain't real careful, you end up being known as the oil person, not the vegetable person. So I think you got to be careful with those other add-on items, whether it be jellies or oils or stuff like that. Because next thing you know, you'll be putting all your focus in that and not in growing the vegetables. And you want to be known for growing fresh, clean, good tasting vegetables, not for uh, jelly or, or calendula oil. No. That's just kind of my two cents on it. I appreciate that. All right, we got one from George Higdon here, and he says, I'm surprised y'all don't grow goobers. Any particular reason? Now, if a lot of people don't know what goobers is. The fella is speaking about peanuts. <laughs> yep. Now, we grew gobs and gobs, and that's slang for a lots and lots down here in the south of goobers or peanuts. We don't. We now, don't. I say we in our areas. What yeah. I mean, right across the road from us, directly right across the road from us is 100 acres right there. So there's a lot of peanuts growing in our area. And we sell a peanut called wind peanut, but we sell a lot of them. We normally sell out every year. The reason I don't grow peanuts is because they're available. I can walk across the road and get some. However, another reason I don't grow them is the 140 days to maturity is a little bit of a turnoff to me. That is a long-term crop as far as what the investments you have to put into the peanuts. Especially in the warm season. Yeah. So it's, it takes a long period of time Weed control becomes a big issue in peanuts because of the how long it takes them to you know come off there. Once they mat over, they kind of shade them out a little bit, but it's a it's a huge endeavor. Um, we have a lot of people that grow them around. We have folks down in Florida and on that group peanuts. We just don't grow them here because we have so much supply right around us. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to try growing them one time. Just say I did it, but. Um we eat up with peanuts around here. Yes, we are. All right, so the next question comes from Edge Yoder. Might be one of the Yoder boys. Mm -hmm. Great video. How does a new grower find out what prices to sell their products? Thank you. So you'll hear from several different people on how to do this. And most people will, will tell you something that involves comparing prices to what everybody else is selling. And I think, personally, that's a completely wrong way to go about it. You need to figure out what you need to make on these for it to be worth your time or for you to make the living you want to make off of it. So you need to kind of sit down, write down, and figure out what you got into it, time and everything, and use that to determine what to sell your vegetables for. And if you got something you're growing that you can't come out on, you probably shouldn't be growing that particular crop. So for me, it's, it's kind of a time budget analysis. It ain't got nothing to do with what anybody else is charging for okra, cucumbers, or peppers. I think if you got a good product, you can sell it for whatever you want to. So think about the time you got into it and what you need to get out of it. You don't need to be going to the grocery store with your pad every week, looking around what broccoli is selling for and what beans are selling for. That That's the wrong strategy to have. You don't want to compare your stuff to what they got at the grocery store on quality or price either. I wouldn't even, uh, if I was doing a bag like this and I was the only man in town like I am, I, I wouldn't compare my stuff to roadside stands either. Because you got a unique model, you got a unique product. If you, you know, you provide quality out there, you can get a premium for it. Yep. Last one is from Sally Hurt. And she said, you talked about succession planting beans and squash. How about broccoli and other cool weather crops? I recently learned that you have two broccoli seeds that are an excellent pair for doing an early fall crop and later fall crop, like the green magic followed by the emerald broccoli. Which is a great combination there because we all know green magic broccoli is a little more heat tolerant. So you want to plant that one first and then you can follow it with some of the other varieties after that. Now we don't have a lot of those that have those type rotations there to them. To give you an example, with beets and radishes and carrots, there's not such thing. Carrots you're going to plant pretty much one time where we live over when them through. Your collars, your broccoli, your cauliflower, no, not, yeah, well not broccoli, but your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts and things like that. There's really not a big significant difference in the varieties as far as the heat tolerant ones and cold tolerant ones, so it doesn't make a whole lot of difference here. However, one of them that I will tell you is the cabbages. 
On the cabbage, the first ones I would plant while I still had a good bit of heat going would be the early round dutch, which is an open pollinator variety, mm -hmm. or either I would plant the bobcat, which is a hybrid variety. And then when you're planting maybe three or four weeks later on down the road, I would probably go to one of the Charleston Wakefields or the Cheers or something like that. So you could rotate their varieties. It does make a difference on a little bit of them. On some of them it does, some of them it don't. Yeah, and, and in Zone 8B where she lives, we can we can succession plant, keep planting things like beets, cabbage, broccoli, kohlrabi's a good one. Yeah. Uh, you just keep boom boom planting them all throughout the, the cool season there. I've made a meal off that. You done cleaned it out? Yeah. I need me a, I think next time I'm gonna eat me a, mine with a spoon. I think yeah, I can get after it with a spoon there. Yep. But uh, Well, we've wrapped up another show. We have, we have. And I, I, I must, we're gonna see how well these things store on the shelf with our uh, butternuts there. Yep. See if they store just as long as everything else. So, hope everybody enjoyed tonight's show. And uh, thank you all for watching. If you did enjoy it, make sure to give us a big thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that uh, bell notification button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.